All right, so this one will be the video lecture for biodiversity. It's a difficult thing to define. It's one of those things that often we say, we know it when we see it. Officially, the it's the number of the variety of life forms that exist in a particular place. But there's a lot of challenges with this because do we include all of the things or just the indigenous things, like the native things? Do we include the above ground and the below ground? Do we include functional groups, for example, all of the carnivores or the herbivores or the detritivores. Is it species diversity that we're really looking for or genetic diversity within that species that we're looking for? And it's difficult when we say we, sh we need greater biodiversity when we know that greater biodiversity causes challenges for certain areas and certain things. Charles Darwin, this, this, this concept kind of started with Charles Darwin in around 1856. And what he was doing was he was looking at natural areas. And he noticed that the more diverse there was, and he did not define that term, the more diverse an area was, the greater the production it had. And that we kind of define as mass. The more uniform that production was over time and the more stable it was and the better able it was to able to respond to natural disasters or sudden changes in the environment. So that all implies that biodiversity is actually a good thing. So this is kind of where this concept first started. But it, it's hard to quantify. We can go and count the number of species living in, a, in an area. We can often see if they have uniform distribution. In other words, is there an evenness of individuals scattered over an area, or are they kind of, there's a little population here and a little population there and a little population over there. And is that contributing to the diversity of things? Is that how it's supposed to be? So some of the concepts here are that a keystone species, we need a keystone species and we need resilience. Keystone species are highly influential, and when they are no longer there, it dramatically changes everything about that environment. So these are highly influential. We are often talking about things like our top predators, our worms, oddly enough, and our legumes, things that dramatically change when they are absent in an environment. If you on your own click the link to the video, you will get a, a short video on how wolves dramatically changed the Yellowstone. Um, it's about four minutes long. It's really interesting about how when they brought wolves back to Yellowstone Park, it changed everything about the park. And resilience is the ability to absorb change. And when we say the ability to remain unchanged, we recognize that these systems change over time, but it's the ability to come back and behave as a somewhat natural area if you have some sort of natural disaster. Um, or if you have an insect that comes in and wipes something out, can the populations adapt to that? If you get a high rainfall and you lose some of the soil, can the populations adapt to those things? And stability then is the ability to return after that disturbance. Now, here's the question, what are we, re what are we returning to? Are we returning to what it was? or are we returning to something else? And again, some of these things are really, really hard to define. So I'm gonna start this with, with, and this is not a video, this is just pictures, um, a website talking about Mount St. Helens. Now Mount St. Helens is a volcano that suddenly erupted in 1980. And so this, we've got a few pictures here, this is kind of what it looked like before the eruption, and I'm gonna kind of scroll so that you can see some of these pictures of what it looked like prior to the eruption. So these are all fairly old pictures. What are we talking about? 30, 30 plus years ago, right? Um, and then let me kind of keep scrolling here. Now we had started getting some hints that something was going wrong. So here is uh, the mountain kind of stirring. We've got some puffs of, of uh, smoke. This is kind of preliminary things that are happened before an eruption. Part of the volcano sank into it, um, it's venting steam and then it just blew its top. It was, I don't want to say it was a complete surprise because the volcanologists knew it was going to happen. Um, but for the most of the rest of the world, it was like, holy crap, there's a volcano and it erupted. And it erupted with deadly force and it wiped out huge populations of everything 
with lava, with ash, and all kinds of problems. And it was really noticeable from space, and it left this huge crater in the volcano. And there, there it is. So it blew, it literally blew the top off of this mountain. And this is what it looked like afterwards. Everything was destroyed. Everything in the path, the direction of the lava and the ash was completely destroyed. Now I'm going to scroll down a little bit further. Uh, I'm going to keep scrolling and keep scrolling. Um, so here we are shortly after the eruption. And what are we starting to see? Ooh, we're starting to see some greenery come back. There we are, starting to see some greenery. There we are, the plants are returning. Now, where is the resilience here? Where is the stability here? Is there, is it, will it return to what we considered normal, in other words, pre-volcanic times, or will it form some other new normal? So all of these things are very difficult to gauge when you're talking about biodiversity. If we look at agronomic systems, there are some pros to biodiversity. Now remember, agronomic is going to be defined in everything from our field, field crops to our greenhouse crops to our landscapes and ornamentals and turf and national parks and those sorts of things. Right? If you are able to increase biodiversity, we can prove that you actually have a reduced need for pesticides. There's less nutrient loss and leaching. There is greater stability within that particular ecosystem. You can do with organic production. So there are, there are pros to this. We might be able to provide protection for species of unknown use the more that we are able to get different species into our agronomic systems. Then you might be sitting here saying, well, uh, how do I do that in a cornfield? And that's exactly the problem. How do you do that in a cornfield where you can't have a plot of a 10 by 10 fit of corn and then another plot of a 10 by 10 soybeans and another plot of a 10 by 10 apple trees and another plot of a 10 by 10 celery? That's not efficient. So it's very difficult to deal with some of these things because we have all these variable crops. It's going to be management complexity. It will definitely increase the management complexity. You could lower the yield of an individual crop because maybe you happen to have planted that one 10 by 10 square or 100 by 100 or whatever it is, that one square that happens to be planted with, let's say, corn. Maybe that particular square is not going to be good this year for growing corn. How many times you've been driving down the field and you see a cornfield and there's suddenly a patch of them that are just not doing well. All of the rest of the corn surrounding them doing fantastically, this one little patch not doing well. We can intervene, intervene to, to hopefully prevent a lower yield. We, can, we have these germ planter centers, plasm centers, which we've talked about at the beginning of the semester, to hopefully provide some genetic, genetic diversity. We know there's a lot of microbial di diversity underground, but it's not necessarily a system that's very efficient for a lot of our commercial production. It might work better in more of a landscape and or ornamental situation where I on my property can have as many numbers of species of plants as I'm willing and able to take care of. But we do know from human history that a lack of diversity has caused problems. If you look at the Irish potato blight, when the disease came in, when potato blight came in, it wiped out the entire crop of potatoes. And the reason for that was that crop was all the exact same cultivar of potato. And that particular cultivar had zero resistance. So millions of people have starved. Millions of people emigrated to the United States because of it, and to other countries too. Rust stunt virus. And we know that plants have little problem, have little resistance to viruses. Viruses are very easily transmitted. They're impossible to cure. And so when this disease came into the rice industry, oh my God, we have to find some resistance, find some resistance. We tested al almost 6,300 different varieties of rice. Not one had any resistance until we found one. And now that one that's resistant is hybridized with all of the other varieties of rice to improve resistance in rice stunt virus. So in this case, genetic diversity didn't necessarily help us until we found one and we were able to use that particular one to improve the rice crop. 
We've talked about coffee rust before. You might have seen in the last lecture the pictures of the coffee rust on the leaves. Well, this is what it does to the fruit, and obviously that's the problem. So on the bottom is what coffee should look like. On the top is what coffee looks like when it has coffee rust. We've recently discovered in Ethiopia a resistant variety. So it's possible we might be able to hybridize with the Colombian varieties to increase their coffee rust resistance. This is a world, these are worldwide problems that we're trying to solve for various sectors of agriculture. But the Ethiopian coffees taste different than the Colombian coffees. So a lot of things are going to have to adapt if we're going to be able to, to utilize these genetic diversities. You might have heard of Dutch elm disease. On the top is kind of a split picture of what a healthy American elm should look like. And they, they die very, very quickly from Dutch elm disease. On the bottom is the insect that spreads the fungus. It's a fungus that kills the, the, the tree by plugging up the vascular system. But it's spread by this insect, which is a borer that bores through the vascular system. The boring actually doesn't kill the tree, but the boring spreads the fungus throughout the cambium, and that's what kills the tree. It's about 90% 90, 90 fatal to American elms. And it changed how we plant our public street areas. Because ideally what we'd like to see is the 30, 20, 10, 5 rule. No more than 5% of any one species. No more than 10% of any one genus. So a little more than 5% red maple. No more than 10% maples. No more than 20% in that family. And no more than 30% in that order. So that would be the ideal way of looking at things. But it, it hasn't changed. Because of worldwide production and worldwide shipping, we now have emerald ash borer. It is 100% fatal to all European and North American species. We have yet to find any natural resistance. But all the Asian species are resistant. So is there a way that we can learn about the genetics of the Asian species and genetically engineer our American species to be resistant? Or is it going to have to come from more traditional breeding? It happens with our agronomic crops. Most of our corn is what we call Bt corn. In other words, it produces its own pesticide. Um, that pesticide is called Bacillus thuringiensis. I'm not worried if you remember that sort of thing. Um, it is a natural pesticide against caterpillars. When the caterpillars eat it, it kind of destroys their insides and then they basically starve to death. Uh, but because it's always a race against a changing pest and a changing plant and we're finding new things and then the pest adapts to that, we for in 2016 the first bt resistant corn borers were found now they're not widespread throughout the country so the bt corn and other plants still work but pathogens change pathogens adapt to the challenge that they find in their own world so this may mean in five or ten or fifteen years we dramatically have to alter how we're producing corn again so all of these things are changing the genetics and thus genetic diversity might be something that is a greater importance than species diversity when it comes to our agronomic systems. Now, when it comes to our landscape systems, probably species diversity helps because if I have, say, 50 different species on my garden and something comes along and wipes out all of the hosta, it may only wipe out four or five plants and I can plant something else in that place. But it hasn't killed everything in the garden. Here's yet another example of something that, that's relatively new. This is spotted lanternfly. It's a pretty little thing, isn't it? And it has a host range that's quite wide. It was discovered, I think, in 2014, roughly in that time frame. So it's a relatively new insect. So we're still learning a lot about it. I'm going to kind of scroll down. Um, this video is kind of interesting. Videos and recording don't often work very well. But uh, you'll be able to hear how many they are. Notice the plant that this is on. This is on grapes. This is our wine industry. That's a very important industry. It's a very large industry. So this is a plant, uh, plant, an insect that has the potential to, again, wipe out a very large agronomic industry. Um, here they are. They also affect lumber trees. They affect ornamental plants. They affect tomatoes. They affect lots and lots of different things. And you'll notice that they come in a huge variety of numbers. This trunk right here is covered in them. There they are in apples. 
all of our major fruit crops are also susceptible to spotted lanternfly. So now you think apples, peach, pear, plum, cherries, all of those susceptible to spotted lanternfly. So it's important that we perhaps start looking at ways, A, to control this insect, obviously, but B, we want to look at the diversity of our apples and our fruits and our grapes to see if there's any natural resistance that we can look at. So if we look at biodiversity, yes, biodiversity in natural systems gives them more stability. Biodiversity in ornamental systems gives them more stability. But genetic diversity may be what we need for our food crops because that is what is potentially going to save production systems from these challenges which just keep happening over and over and over and over again. Okay. So the point here was to have you think about diversity from your perspective and the perspective of different production systems and where the best type of diversity comes in handy. As always, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to get in touch.